Oh, here we are. Getting the technology note. Uh, she did. She failed, and I won't. I won't call it a real failure. But uh, she. I'm also the, the current uh, editor of the South Carolina Native Plant Society newsletter, and uh, uh, it, it goes out to all our members. Uh, in case there's some questions today, I brought Dan uh, Whitten along. He's going to hand, he's going to handle all the questions that come, so I don't have. To. <laughs> uh, you probably can tell from that title that I may have a little bit of an axe to grind, and you'd be right. I am seriously a native plants person, and uh, normally I look for a stump that I can get up on, but I don't see that you have one here today. But uh, we're going to go through some definitions. Uh, I always do this, and I know probably a lot of you people already have all this stuff, but we're going we're to go through it again just in case. Uh, native versus introduced plants. A native plant is a plant species in a given area of the country that grew there prior to European contact. In other words, it's been, it's been here since before 1491. Uh, the importance of natives, obviously, is they've been here a long time. They have co-evolved. Oops. They've, well, the... the <laughs> these plants have co-evolved with the regional microbes, bacteria, fungi, other plants, animals, have been here for millennia, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, exotic plants or introduced plants, uh, non-native plants, all inter interchangeable terms. Plants brought here from other continents since European discovery of the New World. And I have, I have a tendency to let some irony sneak through from time to time. So when you see quotation marks like that, read Bill's being a little bit, bit ironic here. So the European discovery of the New World, it's, an, it's irony, but... Uh, so they've been here at least 515 years. So they've had a long time to co-evolve. And given a long time to co-evolve means a long time to develop to develop complex relationships, interrelationships. Native plants and soils, they get along. They're, they're compatible. Native plants in the climate, our, our plant, native plants in our climate, uh, you almost never see a, a native plant in a, from our climate being killed by the climatic conditions. Native plants in the local herbivores, the insects, uh, mammals, Forth. So all this time to build complex networks of relationships means there's a lot of internal compatibility in this system. And when it comes down to it, native plants are the foundation of, of native ecosystems and natural communities. So landscapes equals ecosystems. I, 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 I'd like to think of, you know, you th you, use the term landscape, people think, well, there's some shrubs over here and some trees over here and some beds over here. I like to think of landscapes as ecosystems. And, and, and I, I, hope you, I hope you'll come to think of it that way too. Ecosystem, a system formed by a community of organisms. We talk about community. Community of organisms all interacting together. It's all, it's all everything is connected to everything in the confines of the physical environment, the, the soils, the climate, all those kinds of things. Community is a collection of all living things on an area. Physical environments, the geology, the soils, the nutrients, sunlight, rainfall, temperatures, and so forth. So all of these things go into making up an ecosystem. And I like to think of ec ecosystems and landscapes. I see a landscape, I try to think of it as an ecosystem, because it's exactly what it is. That's an ecosystem, it's a very natural ecosystem. That's a habitat for thousands of species. Very diverse system, lots of species out there. Hopefully, most of the species in that kind of a habitat are natives. We know that they're not, because we, get out and we have eyes and we get out and walk and we see stuff that shouldn't be. Hopefully, it's mostly natives. 
the, the thing about natural ecosystems, we talked about them evolving together, developing these complex networks. They develop in predictable ways. Now that we have, we have had a couple of hundred years to study uh, ecology, how, how, how these, uh, uh, all these factors interact, recognize things in predictable ways. They're guided by the regional climate, the regional geology and soils. The physical forces that are present out there uh, have a strong guiding effect on how the native ecosystems develop. Fortunately, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to use this, this pointer because my thumb is too big. Nope. Fortunately, they developed toward a stable configuration. We use the term climax vegetation. Uh, once, once in our part of the world, uh, an area establishes a, an oak hickory uh, vegetation community, it's pretty stable unless some big disturbance comes along, like a hurricane or something. And that process obviously is, is uh, we all know, is known as natural succession. Natural succession results in natural ecosystems, and that, uh, that succession is guided by the climate. Southeastern soils. The bad news is soils in the southeast are dirt poor, and the pun intended. They're highly weathered, they're acid, and they're infertile. This is, a, this, is, this is under grass, under a grass field, and it could easily be under, be under a forest situation. The top six inches here, top six or eight inches, very fertile. Lots of organic matter, lots of nutrients. You, uh, following a very sharp line across there, you'll find that that soil immediately below, below there is very infertile, and it's strongly acid, low pH. The reason for that is, here in the southeast, we've had, we've had uh, millennia after millennia of warm, high rainfall environments. And so our, that's, that's what results in our soils being so highly weathered. Now, remember when our ancestors, our, our English ancestors or our European ancestors came here and they planted that first crop and it did beautifully. And so they immediately sent home, sent a message home the next year. This is this is a paradise. You, you can anybody can grow anything here. The reason they were saying that was they were farming this six, six to eight inches of soil. Now the reason that soil, that six to eight inches of soil, was so fertile was that it was under either grass or trees for a long period of time. These roots had gone down into this deeper soil, extracted all the nutrients, or practically all the nutrients, and then was through leaf drop, all those nutrients wound up in here. So they've been extracted out of here and deposited in there. So our ancestors farming that top six or eight inches within three or four years, their agriculture crashed because they were out of nutrients. Not only did they not, not, not fertilize, but they didn't, they didn't know how to plow a piece of ground. They plowed it whichever way the mule wanted to take the plow, that's the way they plowed it. So they had huge amounts of erosion. Now, our soils are very er erodible. So they plowed it, started breaking down the, the organic matter, took all those roots out, and within, within three or four or five, ten years, the soil was, most of the top soil had been eroded away. Even in the natural state, the top layer up there where there are, are a few nutrients, uh, we would really be in a fix. So that's the, that's the kind of a situation in which these native plants developed and evolved. So do we need to fertilize? Do we need to dump a bunch of fertilizer on a native plant? Only if you want weeds to grow up and swamp it out. These plants developed in a, in a dirt poor situation 
they're compatible with that, and, and, and that's, that's where we need to leave them. So, let's talk about our habitat now. How do, how do, how do we establish our habitat? Well, uh, if we're fortunate, we're able to find a piece of ground like that, a beautiful place to, to, to live. And then we did that, as often as not. And then we did that. We stripped off all that, what little nutrient containing tops all we had, exposed all that. And then we came back and did that. We took it away and then we brought it back. But when we brought it back, guess what we brought back? We didn't bring back the natives that were there to begin with. We brought back whatever the nurseries were selling and the nurseries are selling stuff that's exotic, that's, that's attractive, that's interesting, that doesn't grow locally. Uh, because that, they think people find that interesting. And obviously some, a lot of people do, otherwise they wouldn't be able to sell it. But anyway, we took that, did that, then that, and then we came in and, and established this landscape of mostly introduced many invasive plants. And so we wound up with this. Now, you say, well, what's wrong with that? A lot of that stuff is exotic. That grass is obviously exotic. The habitat value of that, the livestock, the habitat value of that is zero, unless you're a human or a dog. <laughs> and you go down to the grocery store and get everything you need. Uh, so the habitat value of that for everybody but us is, is almost zero. It's a drastically altered version of the natural ecosystem that, that we took to begin with. So home landscaping, what do, what do we do in a lot of instances? We're, we're gradually learning out of it together. We plant non-native trees, obviously non-native lawn grasses, fescue, Bermuda grass. Uh, those are not, definitely non-natives. Non-native shrubs. Uh, we've already mentioned non-native non -native wildflowers. And, and you, you sense the irony again. By doing all of this, we create a situation that calls for a lot of management, a lot of fertilizer, a lot of pesticides. We've got to water on a regular basis. So, you know, one could say that, that we're, we're insistent on shooting ourselves in the foot here. Now, we're all interested in wildlife. I mean, uh, it's, it's hard to find someone if you ask them, are you, are you interested in wildlife? And they, no one will say, tell you, no, I could, I could care less about wildlife. So, but even there, our tastes are kind of confined. Butterflies, songbirds, good. Pollinators, good. Plant chewing insects, eh. Squirrels are cute but annoying, and I, I'm totally on, on, on board with that. White-tailed deer. I don't have any, I don't have much in the way of shrubbery, so I don't have to worry about that. A lot of folks do. Woodchucks, I, I don't get me started on woodchucks. I, talk, <laughs> I like to have a, a vegetable garden every year and they like to eat my vegetable garden. And so we're, we're constantly having a war around my uh, vegetable garden. So we're interested in wildlife. But when we construct our human habitat, we destroy habitat. We destroy wildlife habitat. Now, this newly landscaped home site, uh, somebody tried to do a job of restoring, uh, and, and there's been no, res <laughs> no eff effective restoration there. It's, it's just, you, re you recover the ground with stuff you thought would be pretty, I told you I was going. I told you I was going to get on the stump here a little bit, and uh, I, I don't. I don't really uh, dislike people who do these things because I'm, I'm guilty. I'm almost as guilty as a lot of folks. So what do we plant in our in our habitat? The plants that we use are a preponderance of introduced plants: Bradford pears, crepe myrtles, Oriental azaleas, Japanese silkgrass. Japanese bloodgrass, Japanese maple, 
Chinese privet. Japanese this and Chinese that. If you see sinensis or japonica on the, as, a, as the species name for something, count on it not being native. People say, Bradford pears, Bradford pears are beautiful. That can't be an invasive problem. That, that, that can't be problematic. Oh, well, yes, it can. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at that in a little bit. So what's wrong with these introduced plants? Why, why are they not the thing to do? Because they've been here 515 years. Limited period to co-evolve with our, with our climate and, and our other uh, organisms. They're not very habitable, not very hospitable to native insects. And people will say, oh, that's because they're resistant. They're pest resistant. Well, we're going to talk about those pests in a little bit. And, and, and I'm going to put pests in quotes, too. Limited time to co-evolve these insect fauna, so they're pest resistant. And uh, a lot of folks... Well, it, it, it turns out that a lot, of our, a lot of our weedy plants, if you look at a list of weeds that, that farmers have to endure, that, that turf managers have to endure, a lot of them are introduced and, and become invasive. So what, what we've done here, what, what I've just described, we took a functioning natural ecosystem, stripped it of the natural vegetation, destroyed a natural community, established a very different plant community and a plant community that has no habitat value for anyone except us. If we really want to restore habitat for pollinators and songbirds and other wildlife species, we got some work to do. We've got to shift our priorities, change our ideas about what's beautiful, we learn to think when we need to learn to think like a bee or a songbird. There's that that uh, bee is working overtime. He's got enough pollen there. He could pollinate. He could pollinate in a whole whole orchard if he had to. And there's that bluebird harvesting food to take back to the nest for the babies. Important. Our, of our ecosystems and we're gradually coming to really appreciate their role and, and, and become advocates for them. If we don't have pollinators and if we don't have pollinators the future is going to be grim. We're going to have to figure out how to make food out of algae. <laughs> the very idea of eating algae is, sounds revolting to me. Uh, to have pollinators, we have to grow pollinators. We can't go out and buy them and bring them in and, and put them to work. That means we've got to have, provide a suitable habitat for their reproduction on site. We've got to stop killing too many of them. We need to minimize the use of insecticides and ask the question, is this spraying or this dusting really necessary? Because if we, if we we're going to have to grow them, and, and we're going to have to stop killing so many, otherwise, otherwise uh, we won't be able to keep up. Provide habitat for them, and that means more pollen, more nectar. We can do that in two ways. We can stop destroying the sources of nectar and pollen by going out and stripping, stripping the landscape down. And we can also plant more suitable species of pollen and nectar producers. And not all pollen is created equal. Those of us who, who blame goldenrod for, for that ragweed-induced pollen uh, uh, allergies in the fall uh, understand that. We wouldn't destroy pollinator habitat. That's not the kind of people we like. weed whack. Those stuff out there on the edge of the property, we're destroying pollinator habitat. We mow our lawns every week. All those, all those white clover plants out there. When you walk through there, if you, if don't look down, otherwise, you just know that you're going to get stung by all those bees that are down there harvesting nectar. We, some people actually go in and spray herbicides to clean the clover and the dandelions out of out of their lawns. That's destroying 
uh, pollinator habitat. When we encourage, and, and there are those among us who go and who send letters to DOT or the county road management people, encouraging them to mow those roadsides more frequently to keep them neat. Well, guess what we're doing? We're destroying pollinator habitat. There's a, dand there's a dandelion. That bee looks perfectly happy. There's a white clover flower, another happy bee. Or we can go out there and take care of that, those uh, dandelions and that clover by spraying 2,4-D. Well, go ahead if you want to kill uh, pollinator habitat. This is a golf course or somebody's huge front yard. It's almost pure something, probably fescue. Habitat value, this is where pollinators go to die. There's nothing there for a pollinator. If that grass were, were allowed to pollinate, it would be wind pollinated. Roadside management. Take this roadside mowing very seriously. Got all this hardware. And numerous crews in there. You know, in, in our neighborhood, they're out there. On our, I live on a small country road, and it, they're out there at least twice a year. Just about the time the, uh, the butterfly milkweed is, is blooming, they immediately come through and blow it all away. Uh, and on the, on the interstates, they're out there, uh, and, four lane, and four lane highways, they're out there even more frequently than that. <laughs> it's such an important thing that they are doing that they develop this high tech equipment to do it with. So this is, this is very efficient ways of destroying pollinator habitat. Not only that, they get out there on those slopes so steep that, that, that I wouldn't do it just for, for, just for fear of, uh, of death. They get out there and they, they destroy an established sod because the tractor is going to slip sideways and, and rip the sod out. So we got to stop destroying pollinator habitat, and there are any number of ways that, that we do that without maybe thinking about it sometimes. We got to grow more native plants in our landscapes because native plants produce the resources that native insects need. Native insects are, are a big part of our native. You can we can grow meadows in our landscape. Or we can, if we don't want to, if we don't want to uh, devote a, a large area to a uh, to a meadow, then a small meadow-like uh, flat bed, isolated beds, but just something to get more natives into that mowed lawn, which we which we've already agreed is very low habitat value. That's meadow landscaping. I don't know. I find that attractive. Silly me. We also could encourage the roadside mowers, and I'm serious here, we need to be talking with our county managers and, and pers try to persuade them we don't need these roadsides to be mowed that often. All they really need to do on a roadside is to prevent trees from developing and crowding out the roadway. We can do that once by mowing it once every two to three years certainly by mowing it once a year, and that can be done in the winter when, when there's, no, there's no, nothing blooming out there, so we're not destroying pollinator habitat to mow then. You don't see them out there in the winter, you see them out there during butterfly milkweed season. <laughs> Does anyone see a crazy guy in this picture? It's not the guy driving the, the old model Porsche. That, that's crazy. They need to relax. Put those rev county revenues to work for better things, like planting some native wildflowers along the roadsides rather than demolishing them. They even have mower drone, drone mowers now. This guy down there has, has a, a drone, a, a joystick. <laughs> He's mowing the road bank. 
Admittedly, he probably lived longer doing that, but uh, I, I see this as way over the top in terms of managing our roadside. Just a highly efficient pollinator habitat destruction. We need to preserve things like these uh, wooden forest oak hickory sites. We need to preserve old fields because those are excellent, excellent pollinator habitat. We got several different species of, of, of wildflowers in, in, the, in the old, old field, uh, lots of different trees and, and forest floor species over in the forest that have their own pollinators that, that, they, uh, that service them and they uh, service back. Good, good pollinator habitat that we need to preserve. So that's, that's a natural ecosystem. Old field vegetation is very good habitat. And we need, we desperately need insects in our ecosystems. Pollinators, a lot of, a lot of our more efficient pollinators are insects, like, the, uh, like our, our big favorite, the monarch butterfly. Uh, and then uh, songbirds. The reason we need insects for songbirds is those little babies over there, if you try to feed them nuts and berries, they'll never make it. They need protein because they're making muscle and feathers. And they need protein in the, in the, in the most efficient way to get protein into them is to feed them insects. And so that's the reason you see mom and dad birds coming about to chasing down insects, trying to bring the babies to maturity. Insect larval stages. This, this, this stage is, is an active pollinator. This stage, and that's a different species obviously, but insect larval are the bird feed. And if we, can't, if we can't manage to produce some insect larval stage in our landscape and be willing to put up with some leaves that have been chewed on, then, then we just may as well give up on, on contributing to the uh, the recovery of songbirds. Insects are bird food. Mom and dad can, can, can eat nuts, berries, seeds, and do just fine, because all they need is energy. They, they don't, they don't not, they're not having a massive uh, job of building up protein. They're just, they need energy to, to chase down bugs. Make new birds, we gotta have insects. So to have more pollinators and more songbirds in our system and, and, and we all we are, we're all how many people in here are bird watchers? Okay, vast majority of us. Turns out that, that around forty percent of the population of the United States is song bird watchers, uh, bird watchers. And it turns out that the, that percentage has doubled in the past 50 years. More and more increasing interest in songbirds. Well, what's happening to the songbird population? Go in there. So we got more interest in songbirds at the same time the population are going down. What's wrong with this picture? We need more native habitat and when we get more native habitat, we'll have more pollinators and we'll have more songbirds. So what do we plant in our habitats instead of a lot of, a lot of our landscapes landscape contain azaleas. And crepe myrtles and oriental azaleas are not really invasive, but they don't contribute to insects habitat. And remember, if we're going to have pollinators and songbirds, we've got to have insects. Japanese silk grass, Japanese blood grass, Japanese maple, Chinese privet. Seems like if it doesn't come over on the boat, 
it's not worthy. The problems with the introduced plants, we, we've, gone, we've gone through that. We need to stop planting invasive plants. We need to stop planting invasive uh, Bradford pear. Well, let's just look at some pictures. There's Bradford pear. There's a specimen tree over there top left. There's what the birds have done with the little pears that get produced on supposedly sterile, non-fruit non producing Bradford pear. Turns out that if you've, got a, if you've got a regular pear within a mile, the very effective pollinators are gonna haul pollen from those, those uh, regular pear trees to the Bradfords, and all of a sudden you've got this. And to look closely at this, you see that. Those thorns are that long, and they're so sturdy that they will puncture a tractor tire. So I remember uh, running into a blog where a guy from down on the coast was, uh, was raving about what a beautiful tree Bradford pears are, in it. and he was getting flack from all over, the, all over the upstate about it. It's invasive. I can't believe that. So I sent him a picture of something like this. I sent him that and that picture. And, uh, I, I, and I didn't hear from him again. I, hopefully, we, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully between us, we, we turned his head around. Chinese wisteria. Lovely thing. Uh, but the Forest Service spends lots of money controlling it out in the forest where it leaves old home sites and covers acres. There is an American native wisteria that, that uh, is not invasive. Nandina. How many of you knew Nandina was, a problem, was problematic? Seriously problematic. This is, I'm not going to name names, but this is some text from a, from a university website talking, discussing Nandina. Uh, Suggested uses for Nandina include border, specimen plant, and foundation depending on the cultivar, okay? But later in the same text, Nandina is considered an invasive plant in the southeast U.S. Not recommended as suggested landscape plants. Well, he just re recommended it about, about two column inches up. Some bird species such as cedar waxwing, northern mockingbird, and robin, Contain because it's the last thing to go, and, and they're, they're still hungry, so everything else is gone. They, they gorge on, on Nandina berries, contain cyanide, and, and uh, in, in that situation, we've lost, uh, we've had some significant bird kills. Contains cyanide. That's serious. Tropical milkweed. I thought all the milkweeds were just great for, for, for butterflies, particularly monarchs. There's a significant body of science, though, that, that says that tropical milkweed, which is not native to the U.S., native to Mexico and further, and further south, Asclepius curasavica, there's a lot of scientific research accruing that suggests that the thing is hazardous to the health of, of monarch populations. The reason it is, it's tropical. It doesn't, it doesn't have to shut down to, to get through the winter, so it keeps blooming. If you, if you went maybe to Columbia, you'd probably see this thing still blooming down there today. So uh, the monarchs see all this milkweed. Say, Things are fine. It's, made, I thought it's not as late as I thought it was. And they wind up. Uh, uh, breeding, another breeding season in that, in that uh, habitat. This promo because they stay there such a long time, it's promoting the transmission of, of pathogens, parasitic organisms that are parasitic on, on monarchs. And uh, so the science is beginning to tell us, don't use this thing. We've got, we've got 
19 native species of, of milkweed in South Carolina. Why do we need to plant that thing? It's big and it's showy and it stays there a long time. But that's, all, that's, not, that's not all good news. Butterfly bush. Now, I think probably here's where I come closer to stepping on his toes presentation. Butterfly bush. It's a wonderful nectar source. You see, ne you see butterflies all over it. And, and uh, that's, uh, so a lot of it gets planted. But as far as larval hosts, that is the reproductive stage of, of these butterfly species, it hosts only one butterfly species, the larval host stage. But what happens is all this nectar, boy and girl butterflies come around. They get a big dose of nectar and then they decide to do what boys and girls everywhere always have done. And so we got a bunch of fertile eggs. They're going to have to be laid somewhere. So you lay them on that as often as not, well, mo much more often than not, those eggs are never going to turn into mature uh, butterflies because it's not a suitable larval host. Ecological trap. Excellent source, great for adult butterflies. But the bad news is terrible on, on reproduct reproduction of the butterflies. Empress tree. Again, very attractive tree. Very invasive and doesn't host only two lepidopters. Lepidopterans are, are butterflies and, and moths. Uh, only two lepidopteran species uh, are able to reproduce on empress tree. But if you look along the highways where it gets planted, you see it spreading and spreading. Very invasive. So we're doing, so we're doing a lot of things wrong. We got to learn what the good things are and doing them. What can we do to help bring back good habitat and the accompanying pollinators and songbirds that, that we desire? We need a better approach to land development. Kinder, gentler. Let's don't totally destroy the, to the natural landscape. You went out there and thought, and you thought, well, this is beautiful. But then, as often as not, we go out and we destroy what destroy the reason we bought it. Think house footprint. You don't need to think bulldozer from uh, fence row to fence row. Think house footprint. And then think design around those important landscape elements. That hundred year old oak tree, for God's sake, don't take that thing down. Naturally occurring wildflowers or that native uh, natural that native road of that was naturally occurring on the site, don't, for God's sake, take that down. So we need to preserve what we find if it's good, and then we need to be planting natives. Planting them in our landscapes, in our gardens, in our lawn areas, plant native meadows instead of, and, and, and replace as much of the lawn as you think you can stand with native meadows. And this amounts to a much better attempt at restoring that natural landscape that we destroyed to begin with. So, some interesting natives, and this is just a very partial list. Uh, service berry, we all know service berry, a beautiful thing. We say that is a wonderful alternative to Bradford pear. Early bloomer, just like Bradford pear. Fruits, birds love the, love the fruits. Oaks, any kind of an oak almost, except there's a couple of, there's a couple of uh, oak species that are introduced and invasive, but uh, the oaks as a group host 532 species of moths and butterflies. And when I say host, the larva can reproduce on oaks. 532 species. And that's oaks as a group. Obviously no one species hosts that many or, or it wouldn't make it. Persimmon. 
persimmon makes a lovely tree. Uh, maybe when maybe when the fruits come, uh, get out there a couple of days, a couple of times, and shake the tree. And if you don't like persimmons, uh, scrape them up. But wonderful wildlife food. Sourwood. If you want to, if you want to have pollinators reproducing in your in your woods, sourwood is a wonderful plant. A wonderful bee nectar plant, and, and your local beekeepers will, will love you for it. Plus, it doesn't look half bad either. Along with that, we need to go out there and look at, take an uh, inventory of our landscape and see what we can rip out that's, that's uh, introduced and invasive. Take out some of those introduced plants. They're not good hosts. A lot of them are invasive. And replace them with natives. So, a good summary paragraph. Why is it important to go native? Native plants are, in, are compatible with that insect herbivory. They're fine with, with insect larvae or whatever chewing on. So they support more insect production. And, and you know, just on the surface of that, that sounds like not a good thing. But if you're interested in, if you're interested in having more pollinators and, and songbirds, it, that's an absolutely vital thing because the native insects are the important pollinators and the native plants produce the basic food stock for growing baby birds and that is the, the pollinator larvae. So information on, on some alternatives that are available. This is a wonderful book by Colston Burrell, Brook, Brooklyn Botanical Garden. Native Alternatives to Invasive Plants. It, it, was, it was written in, by the Brooklyn, in, the, in the Brooklyn Botanical Garden, but uh, I find that, that, it, that most of the information that he presents is very applicable all over the East. Also, you can go to our website and we have lots of information sheets that, that uh, give, you, give you alternatives. Information on increasing pollinators. There's a number of websites you can go to, and if you want to, if you want to learn about uh, native plants for pollinators, just go Google native plants and pollinators, and you will get a truckload of uh, citations that you can go to. You'll be reading for a week if you do that. But one of the best books that's out there is, is published by a, a group called the Xerxes Society. They are very, their whole reason for being is uh, saving and promoting pollinators. And they're a 501c3, just, just like we all are. And uh, uh, they give, uh, they put on uh, two-day workshops from time to time all over, uh, all over, all over the country, basically. I, I, I attended one about three years back over in Georgia, but since that time they've had, them, had a couple of them at least in, in South Carolina and I'm sure in North Carolina. So uh, uh, buy the book and if you, go, and if you uh, go to the uh, pay your way into the workshop, you'll get a copy of the book for free and uh, you, get, you get experts talking about the ins and outs of growing, producing pollinator habitat. Information on native uh, plant connections, songbirds. Everybody by now hopefully is, is, is aware of Dr. Doug Calamy and his wonderful book, Bringing Nature Home. If you haven't read it, read it. If you've read part of it, go home and read it all. It, it's all good. He's got out a new one now that he put out, that he has put together with Rick Dark, who's a uh, landscape architect, uh, plants person from up in the uh, mid-Atlantic states. And for information on all kinds of native plants issues, uh, the South Carolina Native Plant Society with our website at www.scnps.org. You can find lots of information sheets there. You can also track our activities, which everyone is, is welcome to 
uh, participate in. You don't have to be a member to participate. Participate in one or two, we've got you then. We, we have some pretty good uh, activities.